What if you knew heaven is real because you'd seen it? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. Because you'd been there. When I fell off that horse, I was dead before I hit the ground. How would it change the way you live your life? He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Get the real story from those who've seen what happens when we die. Life Beyond the Grave, this week on The 700 Club. When you first meet her, you'd never know. She's beautiful, articulate, a caring mother of two children. But Paige Torgerson has a dark past, and there's a reason she wants you to know her story. Things that happened that I didn't really see as, as abnormal because I didn't have a normal picture of life. Normal to Paige was a mother who married six times. She thought she was making the right decisions. She thought that each marriage was the right thing for us. Normal was a biological father who drank until he passed out every night. He would say that um, his life was just not worth living and, you know, part of it was my fault. It was my mother's fault. Then Normal became a succession of stepfathers and stepbrothers who used Paige as a sex object and her mother as a punching bag. I would walk in the room and he would be hitting my mother. I would try to defend her. And so then he would start abusing me. He would spank me until I used the bathroom on myself. These images are picture perfect. Paige is a six-year-old celebrating her birthday at nine with an impish grin. As a teenager, cheerleader and homecoming queen, but the girl who looked so full of life on the outside was slowly dying. I was um, constantly in fear. I began to just take everything in and put it in a different place so I wouldn't have to think about it. And that's kind of the way I would paint the picture to the outside world. I would never tell them what was really going on on the inside. She broke free from the abuse after high school graduation, but the damage was done. Paige began to repeat the same tragic mistakes as her mother. I chose the same, same type of people that I had been around for so many years. Then she had her first child, a daughter, still hoping that a better man would come along. And I thought, well, this next one, he's going to be the one. And then there would be that moment where we, everything would go south, and I would say, I'm not going to do this anymore. One boyfriend did seem different at first. They even had a son together. But this man, while not abusive, eventually taught Paige how to destroy herself. He introduced me to drugs, yes. And that became my escape. I had hit bottom with that, and, um, and I couldn't function anymore normally. That's when Paige says she first heard the voices. Telling me to kill myself. Um, it got to the point where the voices were telling me to kill my family. The voices were telling me to kill my daughter. And see, my daughter was the love of my life. I would never do anything to hurt other people. And I had always guarded other people. So these voices began to get worse and worse. And I would put my hands over my ears and I would say, stop that, stop. I thought I was going crazy. I thought that I had lost my mind. After five months of torment, Paige quit all drug use and the voices. The same day, as a matter of fact, that those voices stopped, that night was when the Lord intervened. It was the most angelic, the most peaceful, loving voice. You, can, you just can't even imagine. I knew that God was speaking to me. His presence was overwhelming. I was in the very beginning fearful, but then suddenly the fear was gone. I was comforted. I had a peace and joy I've never had. It's like I had a, a sudden reverence for God that I had never known. He showed me moments from my childhood and how bad decisions had opened the door along the way for the demonic realm to control my family. Paige says the vision that followed was horrifying. Suddenly, I was in a holding cell. I was in a very 
dark, dank, really, really scary place. And I was saying, why am I here, Lord, why am I here? Because I thought that he had come to rescue me. And I thought I had died at that point. But I couldn't touch anything, I couldn't feel anything. I could hear these moans and these cries and voices, but I couldn't see them. It's like they were tormenting me. I remember having no communication at that point with the Lord. He didn't answer anything I said. I couldn't cry. I couldn't scream. I immediately knew what eternity was. Uh, there was there was no sense of time whatsoever. I could hear people crying and, and wailing. And I thought, that's my funeral. I'm listening to my funeral. I walked to the door, and as I opened the door, I started to step outside, and I was shocked. But I could see a beautiful scene outside. But inside, it was very dark, very scary, and no sense of life whatsoever. That was the moment where I understood what death was. I tried to cry. It was very clear in my mind that I totally miss God. I could see very clearly visions of the party scenes, the, the sexual perversion that I had participated in, the things that I had done willingly. I could not remember anything at that point from my childhood, anything before I became accountable for my actions. And I remember trying to cry out to God and begging God for another chance. And I started screaming and crying and I said, oh God, you gotta get me out of here, you gotta get me out of here, I, I am in hell. I had a very real picture of hell, the damnation that I could have experienced. Where does a person go after a vision of hell? Paige says she didn't know where to go or what to do. Honestly, I didn't know that I had to pursue him. I didn't know that I had to desire a relationship with him. I had to find God. I had to have that joy and that love that I had never felt. I had only felt that love during that visit with him. She began her search for God in earnest. I was reading the Bible and, and praying and, um, and I began to fast and suddenly God stepped back into my life in such a great way. And he said, I was waiting on you. I've been with you the whole time. I was waiting on you. And when I realized, wow, it was my choice. You went out of your way to visit me and to tell me all these wonderful things and to show me what I could have never known. And you're here again, and I am never, ever going to lose you. So I started sharing everywhere I went. I would tell him how much I loved him. He was everything to me. Um, I would say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. The repentance was very important. Paige found a church and grew in her relationship with God. She reconciled with her father before he died, and she's forgiven those who abused her in the past. Today, she has a wonderful relationship with her mother, who became a Christian too. Paige believes she was spared an eternity in hell. That's why she is so passionate to tell her story. I want to shout from the tallest mountain that people have no idea what happens when they leave this world. They take their last breath. There's no way out, and it is terrifying. If your heart is right, if you really want to get right with the Lord, all it takes is that prayer and the repentance. I've never known love or had an identity until now, and my identity is in Christ. I had never known there was so much joy and love in a relationship with God. And knowing Jesus as your Savior and changing your life, allowing Him to come in and transform your heart and change your life, there's nothing that words can't describe it. Law practice is a stressful environment, and you're dealing with a lot of very difficult situations. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach every morning, feeling that stress. 
He just was burdened by work. I mean, that was always on his mind. You know, it was, it was a hard thing for him to turn off on the weekends or, or to get away from it. I was just focused so intently on my career that I was letting what's really important fall by the wayside. Jeffrey Thompson's law practice didn't take just his time and energy. The fast pace and the constant stress also took a toll on his body. I maintained that stress and it continued to work on me and it also continued to work on my body. And eventually it broke down. I began having stomach pains, severe stomach pains that, that I initially, I just had no idea what it was. I thought I had an appendix rupture. Jeffrey had developed diverticulitis, a painful condition that attacks the intestinal wall. Months of natural treatments had failed, and his condition had become so advanced he needed surgery to remove part of his intestine. But what looked like a textbook operation left him suspended between life and death. And I woke up to a surgeon pulling a sheet off of my stomach. And as I looked down, I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. And then I looked into the surgeon's eyes, and I could see concern on his face. He had been hemorrhaging for almost 24 hours. And they had continually given him blood, but it was hemorrhaging into his abdomen, and I didn't know it, into his stomach. It was frightening. I've never seen anyone so, so pale, but his, his lips were just completely white. My internal clock told me that I was getting ready to die, and I only had a few seconds of consciousness left. I reached up to grab my wife. I was just wanting to tell her how much I loved her and tell her that I was getting ready to leave her. And, and I went to him, and it was right after that I lost him. You know, I could tell he, he left. And he, he took my hand, and then he was gone. And my life came to my center torso and I began to rise out of my body up into that room. Everything was going haywire down below me. They were saying, I'm gonna lose him. They were doing everything they knew to, to keep him alive at that point. It, it looked like it was a disaster going on, but it was the sweetest day of my life. I never had any pain, and I never had any fear. As Jeffrey's spirit hovered above his body, a light appeared. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It started in the center of the room toward the ceiling and began to filter out into that room, and I was immediately drawn to it. And as it began to hit objects in that room, color came flooding out like I've never seen before. My senses became enhanced. I could see everything in that room with perfect clarity. There was an entire dimension that we just simply don't see on Earth. I've never been more alive than I was at that moment. It was incredible. I suddenly had an overwhelming sense of God's presence, of his love, of his peace, of his joy. The thing that was just so incredible to me is how the maker of this universe, who can make the sun, the moon, and the stars in this earth and us, can come down and hold me and comfort me and love me as if I'm the only person in the universe. And I remember thinking about the prodigal son. That's what came to mind for me, that long lost son that had gone out and strayed and he had come back home. And his father was coming out to hold him and to love him and to welcome him back. That's what was happening to me. It's the sweetest love there is. I told him I wanted to go with him. And then I had a fleeting thought. But what about Madeline, my wife, and what about Will? My sweet wife is just falling apart down below me, and I'd never seen her that way. And I'm up here in complete comfort, in complete peace, in complete joy. And then God told me internally I was going to go back. And I remember jolting in my bed, and I opened my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I'm looking at the surgeon, and he's saying, I'm losing him. We've got to get him back in surgery. Jeffrey was rushed back into surgery where doctors stopped the bleeding. When he finally regained consciousness, Jeffrey had a new understanding of God's amazing love and presence in his life. God loves you more than you've ever known. He knows your circumstances. He, he, he knows what you're going through. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach. 
I wake up with joy in my heart. I know he's with me. You can't go through something like that and not be a changed man. He has a peace about him. He's a very, a very peaceful and very centered. He's really not fearful of anything now. Jeffrey's recovery was long and difficult, but the peace, joy, and love of God he found on the day he faced death is now with him in everything he does. There's a peace and a love there like I can't describe to you. And, and it's, it's an entirely different way of living. I've never enjoyed living more, and, and I understand now what's really important. I want to live for God, and I pray that he'll give me the opportunity to continue to do that. Dr. Mary Neal is an orthopedic surgeon who shares her medical practice and her love for outdoor adventure with her husband, Bill. In 1999, they planned an adventure that took Mary on a spiritual journey few have taken and returned to talk about. My husband and I really enjoy kayaking. We enjoy traveling. We speak Spanish. We've traveled internationally a number of times. And so for my husband's birthday, I said, okay, this is the year we're, we're going to do it. So we went to Chile for a vacation to kayak. After a week of kayaking, Bill sat out the final day with a sore back. Mary and the rest of their group kayaked through a treacherous stretch of the river. This is a section of river that's very well known for its waterfalls. These are drops of 10 to 15 feet, 20 feet maybe, which for an experienced kayaker is not a crazy thing. I went over the main drop and as I crested over the drop, I could see the tremendous turbulence and tremendous volume. And as I hit the bottom of the drop, the front end of my boat became pinned. I and my boat were immediately and completely submerged. The volume and force of the water was such that I was absolutely pressed to the front deck of the boat. And I couldn't move my arms even back far enough to reach my spray skirt, let alone push myself out. Mary was stuck. The only thing she could do was pray. I very sincerely asked that God's will be done. And I meant it. I didn't say, oh, please come and save me. I really meant it. I asked for God's will to be done. And at the moment I asked that, I was overcome by a very physical sensation of being held and comforted and reassured that everything was fine, that my husband would be fine, my four young children would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And I believe that Christ was holding me when I was still on the boat and was the one reassuring me. After several minutes of searching, the group leaders realized Mary was trapped under the falls. They came out on the rocks and they kept trying to get to the boat, but the force and the volume of the water was such that they just kept being flushed through. I mean, they just couldn't get to me. At one point, they sort of recognized that it was really turning into body recovery, uh, not so much of a rescue. My body was being sucked over the front deck. And so what that meant is when it got to my knees, my knees bent back on themselves. And I could feel that. And I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I analytically was thinking, well, feels like my tibia probably broke. But I wasn't screaming. I didn't have pain. I didn't have fear. I didn't have that sense of ear hunger. I know I've been underwater too long to be alive, yet I feel more alive than I've ever felt. And this is more real than anything I've ever experienced. As my body broke free from my boat, I felt my spirit break free from my body. And I rose up and out of the river. Mary looked down on the river as she left her body. Then she was met by a group of heavenly beings. They were absolutely overjoyed to see me and greet me, and I them. I knew that they had known me and loved me as long as I existed. And I knew that I had known them and loved them. 
and I knew that they had been sent by God. They began taking me down this exceptionally beautiful path that was brilliant and they were taking me toward this great domed structure of sorts that not only was exploding with beauty and color, but it was exploding with this absolute love of God that was beyond anything I could ever describe or ever truly explain. And I could hardly wait. I was absolutely overwhelmed by this sensation of being home, of being where I belonged. But just as quickly, there was this sense of disappointment that descended on everyone. And the spirits who had taken me there told me that it wasn't my time and I had more work to do on earth and I had to go back to my body. After what seemed like hours with her heavenly host, Dr. Neal returned to the river and watched as her friends recovered her body. I could see my body being pulled to the shore and I could see the guys start CPR. I felt like he was looking right at me and begging me to come back and take a breath. And I laid down and I was reunited in the middle of a very remote part of South America. Dr. Neal had been gone for over 15 minutes, perhaps as long as 25. Certainly longer than medical science can explain her survival. She was flown back to the United States where she slowly recovered from her injuries. In her book, To Heaven and Back, she talks about how the reality of God's love has changed her for eternity. All of the promises of God are true. God loves each and every one of us and really is there and is working in each and every one of our lives. That love is everything. If we truly could accept that, I mean, it, it changes everything. It changes the way you view every moment of every day. The fact that there really is life after death profoundly changes the way you approach every moment. Hell is definitely real. It's real. Very much real. Carl Knighton knows what hell is like because he says he went there after he accidentally overdosed on a drug called Valium. Like the Bible says, you in torment. Even though it happened more than 20 years ago, Carl was able to draw pictures of what he says he encountered in hell. The one in the middle, they, they trying to get out, out of, uh, out of the fire, but it, it's, no, it's no way they can get out. There's no hope for them. Uh, there's no way of escape for them. Carl grew up in a Christian home where he had been taught that heaven and hell were real places. Even as a child, he was sensitive to the things of God. I always felt the presence of God. I've seen angels of God at a young age and that let me know that God was with me. After high school, Carl joined the Army and married. Both his marriage and his military career were short-lived. And, and platoon leader, I mean platoon star and squad leader, would come to me and, and they say, oh, you're not doing your job, and you should be doing better than this, and you're not going to never make uh, the next rank. And so I got really frustrated. Carl decided it was time to get out of the Army by going AWOL. He hitchhiked to Ohio to see an old friend. He then went on a two-week drug binge. One night, Carl went to a crack house in the worst part of Columbus, Ohio. You can smell the stench of the, the crack cocaine. You can smell the stench of the marijuana. People was high and laying all across the, the, the floors. Carl smoked some crack and started drinking alcohol and using other drugs. But he says he believes it was the last pill he took that sent him on a journey to hell. And I took that volume, and before I knew it, I fell off the couch onto the floor. It was pitch black dark. I began to quiver, I began to have the shakes, and I began going down and down and down like a deep uh, pit. And I saw smelling the stench of hell. 
is the most rottenest thing that you can ever smell in your life. In fact, you can't even imagine it. I began to feel a tugging and pulling. Like the Bible says, demons tug and nag at you. They was calling my name. Boy, say, we got you. We got you. We got you. You belong to us now. I saw souls, lost souls that was in torment in the lake of fire. They was crying and calling on God. They was hopeless. And I called on the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And soon I called on his name. I saw the hand of God snatch me out of hell and my spirit went back into my body. Carl says that he was in hell for more than half an hour. I was shaking and trembling and I turned my head to the right. <laughs> and they said I was dead. And they said that was there was 30 to 35 minutes. But I know that was a loving God that loved me so much. Three days later, Carl returned to Fort Eustis, Virginia to face the consequences of going AWOL. He was demoted and confined to the barracks for one month. During that time alone, he completely surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. I immediately asked the Lord to forgive me, repent, put them sins behind me, go forward in God. I really gave my life back to Christ after that. Today, Carl is married again. He's also on a mission to tell as many people as he can about the reality of heaven and hell. God loved me so much. He loved me so much that he gives me a second chance. And I'm here to tell the story. Not a story, but the true testimony. How awesome God is. And people will only listen and don't take God for granted. Don't throw your life away. Accept Jesus as your Savior. John Ramirez grew up in the Bronx, where his relatives practiced Santa Lita. My father's side came from a family of witches and warlocks. My father was very heavy into Santeria, very heavy into spiritualism. John longed for a relationship with his dad, but his father was abusive. There was no love, there was no compassion. We watched him beat my mother in, in house. He came in drunk most of the time, uh, demanding stuff, asking for stuff. If things wasn't done a certain way, it was always put down, hurtful words, dummy, stupid, you are gonna amount to nothing, that kind of stuff. I would just stand by the door and look and see what he was up to because I was looking to see if there was time for me. Just to have an interaction, right? We did something, my dad and I did something. But he was connected to the demons. He was connected to spiritualism. John's mother was also influenced by Santeria. At his aunt's suggestion, she took John to a tarot card reading. The lady sent the cards. I had 30 days to do a ceremony or I would be blind. So my mother, as a good mother, didn't want nothing to happen to her son, so we did it. They blindfolded me, did a bath for me with herbs, and they started chanting and calling the five main god demons from Santeria. From that moment, John's life changed. My whole personality, everything who I stand for as a young boy was no longer there. I felt like someone took a black blanket and just put it right over me, spiritually. I wasn't answering not only to my mom and my dad, but I was answering to the demons. John's involvement with Santeria deepened quickly. I was being taught and trained with high-ranked devil worshipers into spiritualism. I went to sinking into funerals, acting like I knew the person that died because I wanted to buy the soul or that person that died because I can get that soul and put it on somebody and die the same way. When drug dealers got killed in the street, I wanted to run out and get the blood because I can use that human blood to do witchcraft. For the first time in his life, John felt powerful and respected. People knew that I was a force to be reckoned with. I liked that power. I was talked down to as a young boy. Now I had the authority and the power that I can do whatever I want. When John was 13, his father was murdered in a bar fight. John gave credit to the devil for relieving his mother's suffering. I'd be up at 5 in the morning calling out to God saying, help my mother, and no one showed up. But the devil showed up because he killed my dad. I believe the devil said, well, no one loves you, but I love you. Your father can't provide for you, but I, I, I'm your provider. The devil said to me, uh, do, do, the, do the religion. I give you anything you want. Just ask. 
John says Satan became the father he never had. John was devoted to him. I light up my candles. I spit the rum. I spit the cigar smoke. The cigar smoke means power. If I didn't have money for a roost, I'd cut myself and use my own blood and pour it in. The whole atmosphere of the room changes. And you know there's something there. And then when it's there, you have to dress him like a family member. My father, I'm here. What would you like to speak to me about? What is it that you want me to do? As time went on, John also practiced the dark arts outside his apartment. He preyed on Christians in particular. At the clubs, I would go around looking for Christians. And I knew that in the club, you was in the devil's playground. So I knew that if I can get into it, and you had a beer too already in your system, I knew all I had to do was just say, listen, I have something to tell you today. And right now, you will open the door, and you said, what is it you need to tell me? You gave me gateway. Eventually, John became a high priest in Palo Mayambe, a form of African spiritualism. As he became more powerful, John took warfare seriously. The devil told me that I had to go into the neighborhood in the spirit round in order to weaken it in the natural. Whatever you kill in the spirit round, you can kill in the natural. So I will leave my body home and I should project myself in different boroughs, different regions, different states, different countries. And as I fly to the neighborhood, I would speak curses into the neighborhood, speak things that I wanted to happen into the neighborhood. Sometimes I will go into neighborhoods and I see this group of people in the spirit round in the corner praying, holding hands, heads bowed, praying up a storm. And there was no accomplishment in that neighborhood. In that neighborhood was sanctified, blessed through prayer. There was, you couldn't touch it. But the other neighborhoods, it was party time. Around that time, John met a girl who intrigued him. I said, well, you know, I can hang out with her. She's good looking. And she invited me to church. She also invited John to meet her parents, who talked to him about Jesus. They had the Bible out. Hey, listen, we want to talk to you about this. I'm like, oh, I can't come to the house. I mean, your parents are crazy. I said, at least let me digest the food, and then you can talk about this Jesus guy. And then after I leave her, I will go to worship. I will go to the devil church and kill animals all night long. And then I will come back and see her, but she didn't know. John found the Christians amusing and harmless. We had a different system that they had. Their stuff was just kisses, hallelujah, we love you. So I kept coming to church to please her but I wasn't gonna leave people I was committed to. One Sunday morning, the pastor gave an altar call. John went forward, but wasn't prepared for what happened next. I said, well, the devil can't touch me here. I'm in front of the pastor now. I'm protected. All of a sudden. I got demon possessed. I grabbed him by the throat, picked him up in there, and said, I came for you. And all these big men came out to see, try to grab me. I was just throwing people around like rag dogs. And then 200-something people got up raised up hands. Spiritual warfare for a person that would have killed them on a heartbeat. I saw the power of God in the church. One of the guys was whispering back in my ear and say, say Jesus is Lord, say Jesus is Lord, say it, say it. I couldn't open my mouth. And then suddenly I was able to say Jesus is Lord. And the devil left. John was embarrassed about the outburst, but not sure what to do next. One of the church elders approached him a few days later. He said, Jesus wants you to have this. He gave me a sweatshirt. He said, you're a warrior for Christ. For someone to come and say, this is a gift in Christ, because he loves you. To me, that was amazing. I couldn't believe that Jesus loved me. But I was committed to the dark side. I was committed to the demons. I was committed to the devil. And I was between two worlds. One night, John decided to end the struggle between the two worlds the only way he knew how. I said, Lord, if Jesus can't have me, the devil can't have me, the best way out of suicide, in my ignorance, in my shame, in my, in my mind that was so far gone, spiritually drained, very spiritually drained. John didn't know how to pray, but he began to talk to God. 
I don't know what they call you, Jesus, whatever they call you in church. I don't like you. I never liked you. I, ne I never had nothing to do with you. I want no dealings with you. I hate you. I don't want to be part of you. I, don't wanna, I never want to be a Christian. I disown you. If that's going to get you away from me, I will worship the devil to the day I die. I whisper, saying, if you are bigger than the God that I serve, then you show me tonight or leave me alone. John went to sleep and dreamed he was on a subway. The train was filled with people, and the faces were drained, and we were going somewhere that I know that was not good. And as the train was going faster than light, there was a lady dressed very elegant, and she started talking to me in demonic tongues. I understood the tongue, traitor, you're leaving us. So I tried to get into the middle of the train, in the middle of the people, so she won't reach me. Pop hit, and the doors opened, I ended up in hell. John stepped out of the subway, and into the darkness. As I went to the tunnels of the hell, the heat wasn't a heat that you feel on earth. It grips you, and the fear ropes around you. There's no hope. The hope is removed. As I got to a part of the tunnel, the devil came out, bigger and more strong. I've never seen him like that. And he said to me, I've been with you since you were nine years old. I've been a father to you. I've given you everything. He said, I'm going to keep you here, because if I can keep you here, you won't wake up upstairs, which is on earth. And he said, you belong to me, and you're not going to leave. You know too many secrets about my religion. And when he went to grab me, to snuff me, this three-foot cross appeared in my hands. I couldn't understand how a cross would appear in my hands. I never called for the cross. I put it on the devil. And he felt like nothing. He felt like he was a, a baby. No powers at the foot of the cross. When John woke up, he was a changed man. And I knew that Jesus was the Lord. I bent my knee to the cross. And Jesus came into my life. I took a white piece of paper, and I wrote down a servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. I serve you all the days of my life. John threw out all of his witchcraft paraphernalia but the battle wasn't over. He was under spiritual attack every night for the next month. At night, I felt a presence coming to the room. And then when I would turn around, I would actually sometimes see what was there. Or sometimes I would just slip around and somehow fall asleep up this way and I would just feel someone's hands just grab me by my throat and try to pick me off of bed and try to rip my body. I rip my soul out of my body. Sometimes they grab by my feet and the bed would shake and it would bring it up and levitate the bed and levitate me to the point that I was, sometimes I might even reach the ceiling. And I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't cry out. I couldn't talk. I felt like I was choking. I felt like they were choking the life out of me. And I would try to call out for Jesus. And the words wouldn't come out. And then in the end of the word, my Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Saves me. And it would go away. John didn't understand why God permitted the nightly struggles. I asked the Lord, why did you allow this to happen to me? Why this torment? Why did you allow these people to abuse me this way? I gave my life to you. I told you I would serve you. And he said to me, I wanted to know how much you love me, how much you trust me. And no devil ever showed up to my house ever again. John says he wouldn't trade anything for what he's found in Christ. For 25 years of my life, I was able to do anything to anybody. Anyway, I count that out to be foolish to gain Christ. He's my own all. He's the breath that I breathe. He walks with me. I can hear the sound of his voice in my ear. Today, John shares the gospel with everyone he can. He has written a book about his experiences called Out of the Devil's Cauldron. I've been victorious in Christ. I got peace. I'm not empty no more. I got fulfillment, I got a purpose, and I have a destiny today. And all because I say yes to the cross. And I am an evangelist for the kingdom of light. No more an evangelist for the dark side. I expose the dark side every time the Lord gives me a chance. Because we don't have to die in your sins. You don't have to shed blood like in Palamanyumbe. Jesus shed the blood for you. That's the blood that counts, the one at the cross. Dorinda Lowe never saw it coming. 
a semi-truck ran the red light and plowed over the top of her car. The 18-wheeler barely missed her head, but practically severed her arm. Her legs were caught underneath the engine. The car literally collapsed around her, trapping her inside. We could tell right away that, um, that both of her arms were broken, and uh, we knew at least one of her legs were broken, possibly the other one. Plus, we was pretty sure she probably had some internal injuries to, to go with that. It was a pretty low percentage on whether she was going to make it or not. It was definitely life-threatening injuries. Rescue workers tried for 45 minutes to get Dorinda out of the car. Finally, she was life flighted to Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana. It was very grave. I mean, she had uh, lost a lot of blood when she first came in. You know, the fractures that she had uh, were all very serious. And then when you throw on top of it that she had all these injuries and all these other lacerations and tears in the skin. She had a ruptured spleen and a ruptured liver. She was in a very, very serious condition. For two weeks, doctors tried to put Dorinda back together. She had to be resuscitated twice and suffered a massive stroke. She had seven different surgeries but remained in a coma. Doctors offered little hope for her survival. Dorinda's mother didn't move from her daughter's bedside. And even though she wasn't a Christian, she begged God to save her life. When I first woke up, the only thing I remembered was of seeing God. I was on the stairway of heaven, and we were standing at the bottom, and God was holding me in his arms. And I was held like a baby. And I can remember just hearing the voice behind me talking to me saying, you know, it's okay, you're fine, you're safe now. I knew that it was, God was there, I just knew it. I did not see his face, but I knew he was holding me in his arms. I knew he had saved me. I needed it, I was never saved, I wasn't a Christian. I never knew how to actually ask God to, for, you know, to forgive me for all my sins. Dorinda had a long and hard physical recovery ahead of her. She remained bedridden at home for three more months. She had to learn how to do everything again. I was just so scared. I just thought I would never walk. And I had a physical therapist at home that what learned, you know, they worked with me and stuff. And so I learned to walk on a walker. And then on the 24th, they took the walker from me. And I was walking on my own. They were watching me, and I just couldn't believe it. I was crying. I was like, oh, my gosh, I am walking. Dorinda has surpassed all expectations for her recovery. They said that I would probably never use the right arm ever again. You know, they didn't know for sure if I would ever walk right again, but I do walk and I do use my right arm. A lot of times we see patients with bad bone and joint injuries, but to see somebody with this a number of bone and joint injuries and the abdominal uh, injuries that she had, the, you know, the belly injuries and the stroke to have come back like this, it's, it's really phenomenal. It is an exceptional recovery, absolutely. Even more than a second chance at life, Dorinda is thankful God saved her for eternity. There is a God out there and he will listen to you if you want to talk to him and have him come into your heart. You know, I'm lucky that I'm here and I got a second chance that I did not die and then I got to accept him into my heart and he, you know, he forgave me for all my sins. How old are you today? Me. And what is your name? And where do you live? Nebraska. Who's your mommy? Who's your daddy? Daddy, Who's your sister? Daddy. That was eight years ago. Looking at Colton now, you would have never guessed that he almost died in 2003. His father, Todd, tells about Colton's near-death experience in the book, Heaven is for Real. And he started throwing up into the toilet, you know, and uh, at first we're like, okay, he's got the stomach flu because the doctor said it was going around. Colton's condition only got worse as days passed. His doctor discovered his appendix had burst and infection was spreading in his body. Time was running out. And we knew we were in bad shape when they, they said, well, you need to come out to the hallway. They separated us from everyone else. And then someone came to us and started talking to us that uh, we got to have surgery on your kid. It was tough. Um, 
senior boy be lifeless when he was a very vibrant child. And it was at that moment that we were looking at each other. I remember my wife holding Colton in that hallway, just us. He's not even moving. We went to the surgery prep area, and I remember them hauling him away and him just yelling at me, Daddy, don't let him take me. Daddy, don't let him take me. And I went back to the, uh, uh, the pre-op room where we had left some stuff. And I was finally alone, shut the door. And I just broke down, and I was mad at God. I just frustrated, fed up. And I remember telling him, I said, God, after all I've done for you, and now you're going to take my kid? This is how you treat your pastors? And I was calling our prayer chain. I was calling anybody that would be on the other line to get Colton on the prayer chain because it was bad. We were there in the waiting room for an hour and a half, maybe. Then I remember the nurse coming out. Uh, is Colton's daddy out here? I'm like, yeah, well, Colton's up, uh, up in recovery and he's screaming for you. And I'm sitting there with him. And I remember my son in that room then looking up at me and goes, Dad, do you know I almost died? And my first thought was, maybe overheard the nurse say that, or maybe they thought he was under anesthesia, you know, and, and he wasn't. But it wasn't until four months after we got out of the hospital that we finally listened to our son. And that's where I got to see heaven. No, Jesus and some angels came and flew me up to heaven. And I said, so Colton, what did Jesus look like? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. He was wearing white robes with a purple sash, and he just came down nicely and gracefully. Well, Dad, Jesus has markers. Dad, Jesus has markers. I didn't know what he meant, so I finally asked the right question. Colton, where are Jesus' markers? And he drops his toys down, and he stands up, and he just points, Dad, they were right here. He takes his fingers, points to the palms, then he bends over and touches the tops of his feet and looks up to me, and that's where Jesus' markers were, Dad. When I was in the throne room of God to start with, so I got to see what that looked like. I was upset because I didn't know what was happening. What God did is he used people that, people or things that I liked to calm me down. From there on, I felt better. And one day we're traveling together and he looks up at me and, Dad, you used to have a grandpa named Pop, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. Really? Yeah, you used to play with him as a kid and fix, work with him on the farm and, and shoot stuff with him. And I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Well, he told me. A figure came up and he was Pop. He asked me, are you Todd's son? I said, yes. He said that he was his grandpa, so that's where I met him. Yeah, Pop, uh, I was very close to him, and he was my most significant male role model when I was a kid growing up. Kid, but he was killed in a car wreck before I turned seven. Um, I was busy paying bills again, because um, that's um, my job, and he came up and told me he had two sisters. Well, he had to say it several times before he finally got my attention. And finally, I put myself down and looked at him and says, what do you mean you have two si sisters? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby dying in your tummy. And I just looked at him like, well, how do you know you have two sisters? Well, she told me. And then he proceeded to describe her. She looked like Cassie, but she had brown hair. And first time when she saw me, she just came up and hugged me. We knew <laughs> this was true because he said she kept hugging me. She wouldn't stop hugging me, Mom, and I didn't like that. Well, I'm not really the hugging type. I had miscarried the weekend of Father's Day weekend, which made it even rougher. And we thought we'd dealt with it. We got over, we accepted that the baby had died. But when he said he had two sisters, I was. I think I was in shock first and then trying to realize what is he telling me and so I knew that he had seen her and after he described her and he says she's just, she just waiting for you guys to come to heaven. You know as we talked about heaven and he was telling me all these wonderful details I just felt like I had to ask him did he want to come back. I knew that I was leaving heaven because Jesus came to me and said Colton you need to go back. Even though I didn't want to go back, he said that he was answering my dad's prayer. I remember that prayer. That irreverent, that disrespectful, screaming at God prayer. <laughs> I was like, he's answering that prayer? Today, Colton is a healthy 11-year-old. 
and shares his heavenly journey with boldness. I learned that heaven is for real and you're going to like it. I couldn't catch my breath. It was getting shallower and shallower and I can remember saying to myself, I am dying. And then his blood pressure dropped. And I looked at the doctor and I said, what's wrong with him? His heart stopped. And he says, well, we need to intubate your husband right now or else he could die. And then we start doing the chest compressions. Dean Braxton's system was shutting down. It started as a routine procedure to remove a kidney stone. Now he was dying. Dr. Manuel Irrigi was on duty in the critical care unit at St. Francis Hospital in Federal Way, Washington. He explains what went wrong. As it turns out with, with him, the antibiotic that he received was uh, not good for the bacteria. He was resistant. Dean's body went into multi-organ failure, and his heart flatlined. Dr. Irrigi's team worked furiously to revive him. Dean's wife, Marilyn, prayed. I did say to the Lord, I said, Lord, you said in your word that you've come to give Dean life and life abundantly. And I claim that abundant life for him. At times, the unit was in chaos as they worked to save Dean's life. But he was experiencing something very different. I wasn't afraid. It was like, I'm going home. Dean believes he went to heaven. When I first entered in, it was just bright. It wasn't so much what I saw as much as what I experienced. The first thing I perceived was everything is right. There's nothing wrong here. And I said, it's past peace. You know, there's, there's a scripture in the Bible in Philippians, the fourth chapter, that says, peace past understanding. That's what's going on there. It's landscape, but more, because everything's alive. Nothing's dead. I don't mean just live like grass. I mean, it's intelligent. It can move. You know, it thinks. And someone says, well, that's way out there. It was way out there for me. You know, I'll tell you the truth. Dean says he felt like he was being pulled back into his body. Then he flatlined a second time. Again, he was in heaven. This time, he saw Jesus. The first thing that comes to me is he's bright, just like John says, he's brighter than the noonday sun. And the next phrase I say, I wish people could grab it, and it's this one and we can look at him. And what you're looking at is not so much the physical part of it. You're really experiencing the love he has for you. And I tell people it's, it's like he only loves you and no one else. I saw him communicating to angels. He would just look at them. Communication there was thought to thought. They would acknowledge his receiving his information, bow before him like this, and then back out. And it was like, whoa. Dean admits he didn't want to come back. And I don't tell you the truth. I was happy. I was planning on staying, you know. And people always say, yeah, you know, didn't you love your wife and your children? Yes, I loved them probably more than I ever could. But I was thinking, you come here. You come here where everything is right. Then Dean saw family he hadn't seen in a long time. And yet, on the other side of Jesus was my family, my grandmother Mary, but with her were other relatives. And some I had recognized. I had been on this planet when they were here. But then there was generation after generation after generation after generation of those that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior that helped to produce me on this planet. They came to greet me in. And it was like, God. While Dean was in heaven, Marilyn continued asking God for a miracle. 
I purposed in my heart that whatever the outcome, I was going to follow God all the way. After an hour and 45 minutes, Dean came back with a weak but steady heart rate. But the bacteria had done a lot of damage, and he had to go on dialysis. I did not think he was going to survive. I, and I, in a way, I, I told his wife that, you know, now well, we have just to pray and, and wait, because there is nothing else I can do. I believe in healing. I believe that God is a healer. And uh, I was trusting God for Dean's healing. Three days later, Dean woke up. He was so eager. We got to get people saved. We got to let people know about Jesus. Despite doctors' concerns that Dean's prolonged ordeal would leave him impaired or even worse, there are no signs that Dean even had a brush with death. He's the picture of health. In fact, the staff at St. Francis Hospital dubbed him the Miracle Man. It's a miracle that he's alive. There's no question about it. It is a miracle. Yeah, he's alive, that he's talking, that he has no brain damage. Uh, but but this, this is very exceptional because he was really, really dead for, for a long time. So what does a man do who's experienced heaven and still wants to be there? Dean says Jesus told him something that keeps his feet firmly planted. I felt like he was saying, I need you there for it, I need you here. And I came to understand then how important it was for me to complete what God had put me on this planet to do. The bottom line is, until I'm finished here, you know, and I cannot go back home. I tell people most of the time, I'm on my way home. Don't get me wrong, I'm on my way home. This is the pathway my father says I have to go to get home. Championship roper Freddie Vest loves the thrill of the chase and the challenge of competing against his fellow cowboys. On July 28, 2008, Freddie was headed to a calf roping in Graham, Texas. His daughter Lee remembers seeing her father off at the door. We just hugged for a long time and um, I remember turning back to tell him I love him and it kind of brought tears to my eyes. By one o'clock that afternoon, Freddie had made three successful calf roping runs. He was waiting to make his fourth when he suddenly dropped dead in the saddle. His friend, Dennis McKinley, recalls that day. I was just sitting on the fence, and all of a sudden, I saw this movement, all this, this movement out of my left eye, and then just almost simultaneously, this uh, smack. And I looked, and he was on the ground. I jumped off the fence, and I was the first one to him. And uh, I put my hand under his head and lifted it up, and I started praying for him. Veteran firefighter Eddie Smith was next to respond. While Eddie began CPR, Dennis called upon everyone present to pray. While I, I was doing the CPR, I was praying, but I could hear people praying all around me. The Bible says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, I'm going to tell you, there were a lot of men, a lot of women that were praying. Eddie and fellow firefighter Don Lavender continued doing CPR on Freddie for 45 minutes until the ambulance arrived. They got him on a stretcher and they put him in the ambulance and we're looking through the windows and they shocked him and Eddie says to me it doesn't look good. He was straight lining it that means you're dead. We just put him in God's hands. Ambulance paramedics continued CPR and defibrillated Freddie's heart twice while en route to Graham Hospital. Doctors there were able to get an irregular heartbeat and Freddie was immediately airlifted to Harris Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth. His heart had to be restarted twice more during the flight. Freddie's wife and son were in Mississippi visiting family when they first heard the news. A friend called and said there was an accident at the Ropen. She didn't know all the details, but it, it's not good. For, you know, told me that Freddie fell off his horse and that I, you know, needed to get to the hospital. They were going to be care flighting him. So I was just trying to get there as fast as I could. You know, you feel helpless. I, I felt like there's, you know, there's nothing I can do. It was just taking forever. Freddie's loved ones held vigil as he was rushed into surgery. Doctors told the family that they were able to repair his heart, but weren't sure what to expect long term. 
Dr. Denzel D'Souza spoke with them about Freddie's chances for survival. All cardiac arrest, and there's about 250, 300,000 a year in the United States, of those only about 9% will survive. And every minute that passes without defibrillation or restoration of blood flow, your mortality goes up 10%. The brain, you've got maybe five, six, seven, if you're lucky, 10 minutes to get things going again. I actually was concerned that he was going to have brain damage. All they could do was wait. I would go wherever I could to get along, and that's where I would pray. While his relatives and friends were praying at the hospital, Freddie says he was somewhere else. There's a Bible verse that uh, says, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. And when I fell off that horse, I was dead before I hit the ground. I was with the Lord, and he didn't allow me to see what heaven was like, but he let me experience what it felt like to be in heaven. He showed me the love that's there, and there's more love than you can imagine. I mean, the feeling of how much love it is is incredible, and the peace that you have, it's a perfect peace. The only thing I can relate it to is when I was young, I'd crawl up my mother's lap, and she would cradle me and hold me and rock me, and that was the most peaceful, safe, loving place and that feeling, you could multiply it times a thousand, and you still wouldn't be close to what it really feels like when you're there with the Lord. Uh, I tell some of my buddies, there's, there's no uh, I got to do's in heaven. You know, there was no, not a feeling of time. There was no time uh, to worry about, like, I need to go do this, I should be doing this. There's nothing like that. And Freddie also remembers having conversations with God. You know, but when I was there, there was communication, but it wasn't communication like words. The communication was inside of me, and it was nothing that verbally or you would have ears to hear or a mouth to speak it. It was when God tells you something, you, can, you know it's Him. He allowed me to see the prayers that came up for me, and it started with one bolt of light and then there was two bolts of light, then three, and then there was 10, and then there was like hundreds, then there was thousands of bolts of light. Each one of those bolts of light was a prayer that someone had sent up for me. And when there got to be so many bolts of light, it exploded into the brightest light. And I don't know how to explain it. It was just a very, very bright light. And that's when God sent me back. And when I came back from that, I was in the hospital bed, and they had my arms tied down. I was on life support. They had a tube down my throat, had an IV in my hand and one in my neck. And when I came to, I tried to struggle and get up. And the nurse there said, Mr. Vest, you're OK. And I just looked at it and I said, mm -hmm. They said, no, OK, you don't know where I've been. This, this doesn't compare to OK. Freddie made a full recovery but he still questioned what he'd experienced. For a while, I thought, well, I've got to do something. I've got to make something happen for the Lord. He sent me back for a purpose. I need to go make something happen. That wasn't it. For several months, I did that and prayed every morning, why? And so he took me to Jeremiah and uh, showed me a verse there. And the verse simply says, you will go to whom I send you to, and you will say what I have you to say. And I'm a simple person, but I understood that. And that's my purpose. I don't try to make things happen now. I wait for the day and when he takes me to someone and I say what he has me to say. And that makes it pretty simple. Today, Freddie and his family savor their time together. Though Freddie says he still anticipates returning to the place he calls home. Heaven is real. It's a real place. He's a real person. And I look forward to the day that I will get to be there, but I'm not pushing it at this point. At first, when I came back, I, I was ready to go the next day, you know, but I love my family, I love my kids, I love my wife, and I'll stay as long as he allows me to stay. But when I do go, 
they don't have to worry about me. Dying is easy. Living is hard. There's someone out there that needs to know that heaven is a real place. God is a real person. And when you take that last breath, if you're a Christian, you're going to meet him. I got high when I was eight years old. Uh, two of my brothers had got me out in the garage smoking a bong. That was the first time I ever used marijuana. I'll never forget it. I loved it. Randy Hicks grew up one of nine children in rural Illinois with a little parental supervision. My father was an alcoholic. He ran moonshine. Mom held it together. My mother uh, was a firm believer in Jesus Christ. She was a praying mom. Randy's brothers hid the goods in the garden out back, in their school bags, or even under the mattress. One time I found some white powder in here. It was cocaine. I didn't know what it was, and I touched it, and it had numbed my lips. And I was like, wow, that's some strange stuff. And one day I just happened to watch my brother sniff it, and I sniffed some too. And the time I got to high school, I was a freshman. You know, people, people were selling it to make money. time I was a senior in high school, I was selling big time. After graduation, Randy joined the military. I ended up being a tanker, an armor crewman, and they sent me to Fort Irwin, California. Well, up there, crystal meth was big. Well, when I got up there, I got hooked up with the wrong people. I started drinking heavier, and then I really started going on a binge with crystal meth. Oh my God, I was so addicted. It was like I couldn't live without it. I breathed it from the time I got up in the morning to the time I went to bed. I, I started selling stuff to get it. And they sent me to rehab. And eventually they, they released me from the military. It bothered me. I was like, man, I had this great opportunity to turn my life around. Why did I get go back to doing the drugs? But it only got worse. Randy spent a year in jail for robbing a gas station. He was so high, he doesn't even remember holding a gun to the clerk's head. When he got out of jail, he overdosed. He was only 27. They went ahead and pulled a white sheet up on me because they said I was going to die. And they called my family in. When I woke up, it was the most frightening moment because I looked down and I'm looking at a white sheet. Doctors discovered Randy was still alive. After running numerous tests, he was released. But even that near-death experience wasn't enough to scare Randy straight. Randy married, but the alcohol and drug use continued, eventually destroying the relationship. In 1997, Randy's wife left him with their two young children. And I was smoking weed, and I still did a little coke. Not like I used to, but I was still doing it, yes. The moment that changed that, all of a sudden my body collapsed to the ground. I felt something physically dragging me out of my body. And I mean, I looked up and I saw death and I saw hell in his eyes. And it had these huge horns. It, it curled around like a ramp and death just filled the room and it scared me. I could physically feel my spiritual man separating from my flesh. I didn't feel no pain, but I felt it leaving, trembling in fear. And immediately I fell on my face and I cried out, Jesus. I said, forgive me of my sins. God, help me with my addictions. Take it all away. Just don't let me go to hell, please. I was begging. I was crying. I did everything I knew. And as soon as I looked at the door, my door opened. And I saw this long, white, glowing robe, white. There's just no white in this world. You can describe it. I knew without a doubt that the moment I cried out for Jesus, that God had showed up right there and saved me at the moment I cried out. From that moment, uh, man, I just wanted to know God. I wanted to know Jesus. I wanted to know this one who, when I knew without a doubt I was going to hell, came for me. Immediately, Randy's craving for drugs and alcohol was replaced with a hunger and thirst for Jesus. I travel and share what God brought me from, what I went through, what it will do to you, and how Christ is the answer. When you call on that name Jesus, 
he is there right there and he is ready to receive you and to forgive you of all your sins Next thing I knew, off of the distance, I saw white light. Jim Anderson was dying from a massive heart attack. The only signs of trouble came a year earlier, but his doctor called the symptoms stress-related. Jim was working 12-hour days as a supervisor at a wastewater treatment plant. But this time, Jim knew it was much more than stress. I was uh, resting in my bedroom, and all of a sudden I had a crushing pain in my chest and uh, the pain radiated down the arm up the side of the neck couldn't catch my breath and I called to my daughter I said you're gonna have to get me to the hospital I'm not gonna make it a balloon catheter was inserted into his artery he was stabilized and placed on a heart transplant list but two days later Jim flatlined I could see everyone rushing into the room I couldn't hear the alarms going off. It's like I had gone underwater. The, the hearing had just, just faded away. That's when I began to pray. I knew I was dying. It wasn't a scare praying. It was earnest to take care of my family. As I prayed, it got darker to the point it went black. Next thing I knew, off in this distance, I saw white light it was beautiful just wasn't blinding but pure perfect as i started to go towards the light i could see the out, outer edge of it begin to spiral and i couldn't figure out what that was but as i got closer i could see it was the words of prayers revolving the words broke off, going into the light. And I followed into the light. The next thing I felt was being embraced, safe and secure. It felt wonderful. It felt like total love. Next thing I knew, I was looking down the room where my body was. I could see everyone working on me. I could hear what they were saying. There were two nurses outside the room looking in. One said to the other, why are they working so hard? He's gone. If they do bring him back, it'd be a vegetable. I later on told her what she said. She about passed out. <laughs> then, I thought to myself, where's Tabby? And instantly I was in the room where she was. And I'd just gotten finished with that prayer. Um, you know, he's yours, Lord, because I knew that that was the only way he was coming back to us. God wanted him to. When she did that, it's yours. I was in ready and on her face. When I saw her face, I saw every aspect of our life together. From the first day we met, our marriage, the birth of our children, all the emotions we've shared. I couldn't leave her. I just couldn't leave her. And I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I love you so much, but please let me go back. I said, my wife needs me. My children need me so much. Please let me come back. The doctors and nurses didn't give up. They shocked Jim so many times that the flesh on his chest was burned. Then, the doctors heard a heartbeat. I came back to a world of pain. They shocked me so many times. It's like coming back out of order. Just, just. My hearing came back, I could hear them telling me, I can't believe it, he's back, he's back. 
He said, can you hear me? <laughs> and I took that first breath on my own. Have you ever tasted honeysuckle? That's exactly what that first breath tasted like. It was so sweet, so wonderful. And I just thank the Lord. Jim was alive, but his heart still wasn't functioning properly. They put him into a, a coma, a medical, Medicaid coma, and uh, to allow his body to heal. So I wasn't able to talk to him for days. Jim spent the next 17 days in intensive care. He flatlined several more times, and each time Jesus asked him a question. The subsequent times that I arrested and would go towards the light, he would ask, are you sure this is what you want? And each time I would ask to come back. Jim woke up from his medical-induced coma. His heart increased in function from 5% to 30%. He no longer needed a heart transplant. It was a long process, but basically it was uh, good to hear his voice again. <laughs> Very good to hear his voice again. His doctor implanted a pacemaker in his chest. Just a couple of days later, Jim was able to make it home in time for his daughter's graduation. One doctor told Jim he only had a year to live. That was over seven years ago. It's brought us closer together so much closer together. Um, we talk about things now, and it, it's whatever needs to be done for the day, it, it's done. You know, we don't, don't focus on things that are trivial. Jim knows that every day he has with his family is a blessing from Jesus Christ. I try to witness to at least one person a day, to let them know this isn't about me. It's about their life and to know that He is there for them, that He loves them. At the age of 29, Julie Papiavis was in a car accident that left her in the balance between life and death. As she was driving away from a shopping mall, a teen driver ran a red light, plowing into her at 50 miles an hour. The impact jarred her head and neck, severely injuring her brainstem. Her body instantly began dying. Within minutes, the fire department arrived and pulled her from the wreckage. They were unable to detect a pulse or blood pressure. They took her to Loyola University Medical Center, unconscious and unresponsive. Brain scans showed no brain function. The brain stem is really the vital center of where we breathe, it controls our heart. It's sort of our center of life. You cannot exist without a brain stem. Anybody that has pinpoint pupil and has that abnormal posture that she had, the survival rate is very poor. She had a serious brain stem injury that I did not think she'd ever wake up. Julie remained unresponsive in a coma. After several weeks, hospital staff gave no hope of recovery and urged her parents to release her to a nursing home. Somebody comes in with a brain stem injury and is not breathing and is not talking, can't feed themselves, have no control of bodily functions. It's a miserable existence. I just didn't expect her to get return of function. Her parents refused to give up hope. They and their church family prayed for a miracle. To the astonishment of her doctors, six weeks after the accident, Julie woke up. Like all of us woke up this morning, I just woke up. I mean, literally just woke up. Physically, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even swallow. You know, my left eye was not open. I couldn't hear out of my left ear. I was in diapers. I was fed through a G-tube. I was drooling out of my mouth. And, you know, I was paralyzed on my left side. Despite all those physical limitations, Julie had an undeniable hope. I never felt as if I was alone. I always felt that, I always felt the Lord's presence in my whole walk through my recovery. And from the minute I woke up, He was always there with me. And I felt that because of the experience I had. While in the coma, Julie had been given a glimpse of heaven. It was so vast and there was no real beginning or end to it. It was just 
perfect peace. I knew that I was there in that place because I was dead. I knew that and I was not afraid. I was not afraid to be there. I was happy to be there. It was like I was home and I wanted to stay there. She remembers her deceased grandmother suddenly standing with her. My grandmother said, no, you can't go with us. You have to go back. And I said, I can't go back. I'm not physically okay. And I was pointing to my left side that was paralyzed. And she said, your body will heal. And I felt right then that somebody had just like come like put a warm blanket around me and their arms around me. And I knew right then that I was in the presence of our Lord. I felt it, I knew it. And then she said, go back and be happy. And then the next memory I had was waking up in the rehab hospital. Julie was alive, but her road to recovery was difficult, both physically and mentally. I kept thinking and saying, God, why did you not let me stay there? Why did you bring me back to this body that it doesn't work? And I have to struggle so hard to do everything. To wake up in a body like that, like I did, it was so incredibly disabled. I don't know how I would have ever gotten past it if I did not have the story of hope that he had shared with me, the experience of hope that he had shared with me, with my grandmothers. After two months of physical therapy, feeling and movement slowly returned to her left side. Her progress was nothing short of miraculous. With the type of injury Julie had, she, about, she had a 4% chance of surviving. Most people that have a, a 4% chance of recovering, if they survive and they live longer than six months, very often are in a nursing home in a severe disability or persistent vegetative state. Her recovery was not due to medicine. Her recovery is some miraculous event, some miracle that happened because theoretically she should have died. Julie progressed so well that in 2007, 10 years after her accident, she trained for and finished an indoor triathlon. When people hear that I did a triathlon, they say that it's impossible, but I believe nothing is impossible because I have been in front of the Lord, so I feel like anything is possible. Today, Julie shares a message of hope and purpose with others who have suffered similar injuries. I want people to know that truly inside themselves that they matter. There's nothing that's less than about them because they've gone through those circumstances. She has also written a book about her experiences and recovery entitled, Go Back and Be Happy. I have more purpose here on earth to fulfill and, and I take that very seriously. The Lord is with me, which I knew, but it just, it makes it so much clearer. He has been with me through all of it and that he truly has an intention, a good intention for my life. I feel a much closer personal relationship now that he really has a definite purpose for, for my life and for this story and for this gift of hope. What started out as a childhood fascination with ghosts and goblins became a journey that led Ginger Howell into the occult. I was always attracted to scary stories, to like ghost stories. When I read ghost stories, um, it excited me and it thrilled me and it kind of made me scared all at the same time. Even though Ginger's family attended church, her mother had no objections to her daughter's interest in the occult. She even bought Ginger an unlikely Christmas present. I was 13 years old, my mom had bought me a satanic Bible just because I had picked it up in a store and had been flipping through it and she noted my interest in it and she went back and bought it. Ginger's life took a drastic turn when her parents divorced. My mom remarried a man who was very abusive and uh, physically abusive and he was an alcoholic and so my home life went to one of relative peace to one of just complete chaos. So in search of stability, Ginger studied spell books and as a young teen became convinced that turning to witchcraft would give her the security she desired. I did a lot of spells of protection because my home life was so chaotic and I had abuse issues with my stepdad that a lot of the spells I did were for protection um, and I felt that they had worked 
because out of all the children I got beaten the, the less. Doing rituals and spells gave me a sense of power. Reading tarot cards I thought was a way to see into the future and what was going to happen so I wouldn't be surprised by things that would come my way. By the time Ginger was in college, she considered herself a Wiccan and joined a coven of witches. We thought that we were just pagans, that we were worshiping nature as witches. We didn't feel like we were evil or wrong. And in fact, most witches don't believe in Satan. They believe that there's a goddess, and it's almost like goddess worship. The coven seemed to provide the close bond Ginger lacked with her own family. It gave me a sense of belonging and uh, people that were also like-minded and it gave me a sense of, I think, security because I felt like I could deal with my problems that way, that any problem that we were having, um, we could deal with it by making a ritual. Ginger and the other members of her coven cast spells. Some, they claimed, healed people. Other spells were for protection. But every once in a while, even the witches were frightened. We actually saw beings manifest in the room that we were in, and they were very tall, uh, probably six and a half, seven foot tall, and they were dressed in robes, and they stood behind those points on the circle that we had drawn. And we didn't talk about it during the ritual, but then after it was done, we said, did you guys see that? And we all had seen the same beings. These supernatural manifestations scared Ginger, to a point. Once I was doing a spell and I was in a room and it was rather dark and I had candles lit for the ritual, of course, and a shadowy figure came to the window of my room on the outside of the house and my dog started howling, not barking, but howling. And at that moment I turned around and I saw the shadowy figure almost trying to get in. Um, and I blew out the candles and ran from the room. All the time that I was reading tarot cards or doing things um, that would frighten me, I would almost be repulsed by it and I would put it down for a while, but then something would draw me back to it, always. But not all of Ginger's friends were witches. One was a Christian. She was very insistent that I needed to go to church with her. And so I began to go to church with her just to make her quit asking me. Ginger enjoyed the church services and went again, but she didn't see a conflict between Christianity and witchcraft until she started dating Jack, a backslidden Christian who knew nothing about Ginger's other religion. I had just gotten a new deck of tarot cards and I was real excited about them because the, the pictures on them were really neat and a very expensive deck. And so I had showed, I had called Jack in and showed him the tarot card deck and I put him on the table and he acted like I had thrown a snake down and he said, get those away from me. And that was the first time that anybody had ever reacted negatively to the stuff that I had been involved in. As Ginger found love and acceptance from church members, she realized she needed to make some major changes if she was going to follow what the Bible said about avoiding evil influences. I started breaking off from the coven right away. They would call me, they would threaten me, they really were angry that I had left their path and started going down this other path and finally I had to change my phone number and just sever all ties and I moved to a different house and they couldn't track me after that. Ginger and Jack married and enjoyed being a part of the church family. But Ginger still didn't understand what a relationship with God was all about. When I was pregnant with my first child, I began to wonder uh, what to teach him because at that time I had grown, I was no longer in the coven, I had not been doing witchcraft or any occult things, and I was wondering what would I teach my child. Ginger found the answer to her question late one night. She was watching television while nursing her son. I landed on the 700 Club program because a Satanist was giving his testimony and he was talking about how he was a Satanic high priest and how he wanted to come and talk to a pastor about having a relationship with Christ. I thought if the Lord could accept him being a Satanist, then he can accept me for all that I had done and forgive me. And so that's when I said the sinner's prayer at 2 o'clock in the morning watching TV. I became a Christian. 
Ginger put her tarot cards, incense, robes, and spell books in the trash. So the next day when I took the bag out to the curb and the garbage men took it away, I felt like a whole burden had been lifted from me. I felt much lighter after all that stuff was gone. Ginger steadily grew in her faith. Before I became a Christian, I had a lot of doubt. I had a lot of anxiety. I never had peace in my home life or as a child or when I was involved in the occult. But since becoming a Christian, I have moments of just pure peace that you just can't put any price on. Jesus is Lord of my life, and He is alive. He is real. And I just get such a sense of security from him knowing that he's there and he is in control of all things. It's supernatural. Tell me about the, the, the time you received your calling. I was in a small church in uh, Springdale, Newfoundland, Canada, and the Lord opened up my eyes and I began to see in the Spirit. And I saw a portal open in the church sanctuary and I began to see angels first. And then I saw the Lord and He stepped down into the church service and He began to look at everyone in the meeting and He looked into the hearts of the different people there. And I remember laying on the floor and I could feel the power and the glory of Jesus. I felt the God's unconditional love for us as human beings. He loves us all. And as I was watching Jesus, he walked over to me and stood over me and he spoke to me from the Bible and he says, I'm calling you and he said, I want you to go into the whole world and preach the gospel and he said, I want you to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and I'll be with you everywhere. And then he touched my hand and he blew upon my hand and it felt like that warm oil rolled from my left hand down off my elbow and then I, I couldn't speak, I couldn't think. I just looked into the most beautiful eyes in the world, the eyes of Jesus and he put my hand gently back upon my chest and that totally transformed my life, Sid. And, and there was a moment when he showed you uh, some angels that were to accompany you your whole life, and he, uh, he, he showed you one at a time. Tell me about that. That happened a little bit later. I was in prayer, and I saw the Lord. He was motioning to me to come to him like this, and I had a decision to make. Either I could go to Jesus, or I could continue to pray to him in my little room. And so I chose to go to the Lord, and when I did, it was like I was in a, a high-speed elevator, and I could feel myself being catapulted. And my spirit, I believe, came out of my body, and I went up into the realms of heaven, and I came to rest in the the very presence of Jesus and he was flanked by these four angels. He took his left hand and made a motion like this. He said, today I've called you here to tell you who you are. I've called you to be an artist, an author, and an evangelist and I'm assigning these four angels to your ministry. Now said I was a new believer so I didn't know what to think because I didn't have a ministry and almost as quickly as the vision <laughs> or the encounter began it was over and I found myself back in my prayer closet just weeping uncontrollably. I weep for weeks after that encounter. Hello, Sid Roth here with Bruce Allen. Bruce, tell me about the time, and I'm sure this has happened many times, but you were caught up into heaven and you saw someone you knew. Yeah, Sid, that was unusual. I was in a season of prayer and just worshiping God and suddenly I was in heaven, paradise. And there was great activity going on, like bustling. I don't know how to describe that. Almost like Christmas in a mall. And all of a sudden, uh, almost like all the activity is going on because the holiday or the events about ready to happen, you have to get everything in yeah. place. So there's a lot of activity going on. Much in activity. Heaven. Yeah. And my aunt, who had died about seven years previously to that, walked up, and she was all excited. She said, "Bruce, it is so exciting." And I said, "What's so exciting?" She said, "The preparation for the marriage supper of the Lamb is almost complete." And heaven is abuzz with this news and excited because it's the culmination, the completion. And she said, and not only that, many individuals are visiting heaven from earth right now to go back with the testimony that people should be prepared because he's coming back shortly. You know, that's the message I'm hearing from many people, yeah. that he's coming back soon. But the thing that's so unusual is even children are carrying this message oh, back. Yeah. There was a young girl in Singapore that had been in one of our meetings where we were teaching your birthright is to see and go as a Christian. And she caught the revelation and began to be caught into paradise. And at that particular time, I was visiting, I saw my aunt at that time. I saw this young girl, this, she was eight years old, appear off to my left. 
She looked at me, smiled and waved, grabbed the hand of Jesus and it skipped off with him. Mm -hmm. A year later, Sid, I'm back in Singapore and I happened to have dinner with the grandmother and the, the, of this, and she, and she was there and she said, I saw you in heaven and you were talking to your aunt. She now, knew. Now, now that, that really blows some of you out of the water, but read the book of Revelation. I mean, read these visions that people have had, that Paul had. Uh, tell me about this congregation in Malaysia. On that same visitation with my aunt, I saw an angel off to my right standing in heaven with what looked like a Torah scroll, but I came to understand was a manifest. He was the angel that had charge and authority over all the resources of heaven that God had reserved for this generation. So I was ministering in Kuala Lumpur in a church, and they were in a building program for a new church. And while I was ministering... That, they, by the way, that's a good angel to know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the resources for this generation. He, he appeared in the, the meeting. I saw him there and began to prophesy that, you know, as believers, we have that manifest. You know how we activate it? We speak it forth in faith, and it comes immediately. And so as we prophesied, they were taking pictures. They had learned to do that because cameras catch a lot of things. And they caught the picture of that scroll exactly where I saw the angel standing. And so needless to say, I was excited about that. It's one thing to have visions and people believe you, but God gave a tangible proof and evidence of that very thing. This is so amazing. It's Hebrew lettering. So a year later, what happened to this congregation? They built that church, I, I don't know if it was within the year, but within two years, I know for a fact, God supernaturally and sovereignly would bring in the resources consistently as they needed it. Sometimes the bank account would be empty, there was the money, it would show up. They, some, sometimes they didn't even know how. Other times people would give large sums of money, and so they built that church very quickly with no debt, and there was a lot of extra money left over in the church. Six-year-old Abraham was all his mother Angel had. Her husband left them when little Abraham was only three months old. But Angel's joy was tainted by fear because Abraham was always sick. I loved my son so much and did all I could to save him. He suffered from asthma since he was a baby. I worked very hard farming and doing domestic jobs just to pay his medical bills. One day he was very pale and barely breathing. By the time they came to the hospital, Abraham had asthma, tuberculosis, and anemia. That day his temperature was low, his breathing was labored, and his body was cold. I knew he would not survive, so I told them to go home. But Abraham never made it. He died on the way home from the hospital. When I discovered he was dead, I wanted to die myself. In their village, it's considered taboo to bury someone on a Friday, so Abraham's body was kept until the next day. As the mourners grieved, someone said they should call an evangelist who was supported by CBN. When the pastor arrived, he encouraged them and said they should believe in God. Then he said a prayer and played tapes of CBN shows. I assured them that a miracle would happen and Abraham would resurrect. But the villagers started hurling insults at me, saying, how can a person who died over 24 hours ago rise again? But I was encouraged that with God, all things were possible. As the crowd watched CBN's turning point, one of the hosts began to pray for miracles. At that moment, an amazing thing happened. We were all surprised to see the body move. Just when they were ready to take him away for burial, he came back to life. The people were shocked. Then he arose and we thanked God. It's no story, it happened. The boy was dead, but after 24 hours, he rose up again. Immediately, a great celebration broke out in the village. Because of that miracle, dozens of people gave their lives to Christ, including the doctor who had treated Abraham. I was an idol worshiper and never knew the power of God. But when I got to the village and heard about Abraham's miracle, I accepted Christ. Many of my doctor friends gave their lives to Christ too. When Abraham went back to the hospital, the doctor gave him a clean bill of health. He doesn't even have asthma anymore. Though he can hardly remember what it was like to be sick all the time, Abraham has vivid memories of the time he spent in heaven. I 
I was at a place everyone there was glowing. We played a soccer game and I scored. So they said I should go back home. Thank God for CBN Africa. This miracle has truly changed our lives and the lives of others.